Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel and thanks for joining me today. Hope you are doing great. Today's topic is Renaissance love as it started in the life and death of great high Renaissance master golden guy Raphael Santi 1483-1520. When I say great, I mean an ability to rise to stardom during major global upheaval by focusing on positivity. This episode shows how life's fluctuations are a bit like Renaissance love. Raphael's timeline includes major transition during which Charles V and Cortes conquered the Aztecs and, and de deposed Moctezuma in 1520. The Medici, who promoted another Renaissance golden guy, Michelangelo Buonarroti, faced major challenges during Raphael's lifetime. The papal seat changed several times during Raphael's lifetime. From Pius III to the Rivera Pope Julius II, who favored Raphael over other artists, and to the Medici Prince Giovanni, or Leo X. The Mysterious Life and Death of High Renaissance Artist Raphael Santi, 1483-1520 This April marks the 501st year anniversary of this noble High Renaissance Italian artist Raphael Santi of Urbino and his death. We mourn his sudden death and still celebrate his mysterious life and legacy. Raphael was born into a period of intent, worthless vice for political power by wealthy criminal clans which put social transactions at risk. Though Raphael remains neutral and apparently focuses on private and high-profile friendships with Castiglione, Bindi, Guidobaldo da Montefeltro, and papal chamberlain Giovanni Battista Branconio dell'Aquila, he is not immune to the violence around him. Artists of this period follow many unspoken rules and are pawns and mouthpieces of political groups. Raphael Santi, noble child at Ducal Palace, Urbino. Raphael is one of three golden guys, great Italian Renaissance art masters. His identity, like da Vinci's, is of noble roots and is, he was educated at Urbino Court. The contents of a recently decoded letter revealed that before Raphael's birth in 1478, the Urbino Duke was embroiled in a conspiracy with the Pazzi to assassinate Lorenzo and Giuliano de' Medici over a botched property deal. Giuliano was killed. Note the detail on Giuliano's vest. That could be the very design sold by young da Vinci. Raphael's father, Giovanni, 1435-1494, painted at Urbino Court for Duke Federigo III de Montefeltro. Urbino Court is a focal center for Renaissance visual arts and widely associated with Baldessara Castiglione's literary concept, Sprezzatura, Art of Appearing Effortless. Ironically, Urbino, tied to papal state, represents courtly humanist virtues. The breathtaking locale of Urbino, near my mom's hometown, gives birth to Raphael's earliest style, followed by his Florentine and Roman styles. But let's save Raphael's styles for another discussion. Giovanni trained with the poetic painter Della Francesca and created poetry for the Urbino Duke. He knew painting master Pietro Perugino. Giovanni's works are displayed at the Pinacoteca di Brera, Milan, Berlin Museum, San Francesco Church Urbino, Santa Croce Fano, National Gallery London, and the Urbino Gallery. Giovanni Santi da Urbino and Pietro Perugino. Giovanni taught Raphael everything about being an artist at his Urbino studio, but eventually Raphael's talents surpassed those of other child artists, and he was ready for professional training at an early age. When Raphael is 9 or 10, Perugino chooses him as an apprentice for his own workshops in Peru Perugia and Florence. Raphael Santi, Mannerist Painter Raphael revives classical Roman detail from ancient Roman murals and sculptures, such as contrapposto and grotesque ornament, not to be confused with distorted form. Raphael expresses the finesse of sprezzatura, where all forms appear perfectly correlated with one another. 
the art of appearing easy. This makes his subjects appear very graceful and natural. Two tragedies for a young artist. Despite a noble life at Urbino Court, Raphael suffers two tragic losses during his childhood. His mother, Magia di Battista di Nicola Ciarla, dies in 1491 when Raphael is eight. Giovanni's own death follows three years later when Raphael is 11, perhaps when training with Perugino. An uncle, Dominican artist priest Bartolomeo Corradini or Fra Carnevale, at Urbino becomes Raphael's legal guardian. The influence of Fra Carnevale's and Perugino's styles on Raphael is unmistakable. Raphael completes his first work six years after Giovanni's death at 17 in Sant'Agostino, Città di Castello, Perugia, for St. Sebastian's Baronci altarpiece. Raphael succeeds despite corruption. It seems that Raphael's avid use of sprezzatura in his work spills over into reality. He thrives largely due to noble roots and a charismatic personality, despite being an unconventional atheist artist when political tensions rock his courtly world. Given his enigmatic character, Raphael is not above insecurity and abuses authority around golden guy Michelangelo. The Rovera Cardinal Julius II selects Raphael to direct the Vatican Room's project, a choice that erupts in Michelangelo's resentment when Raphael insists that he paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling, a task the great sculptor detests. There is speculation in his punishment one golden guy inflicts on another. When Julius II dies in 1513, the Medici prince Giovanni, son of Lorenzo, succeeds to the Vatican throne as Cardinal Leo X. Leo X and Federigo, embroiled in clerical reform and murder conspiracy, face intense opposition in Urbino, 1517. Although Leo X enjoys his family's great literary humanist tradition, he is of weak spiritual aspiration amidst Italy's firm grips in counter-reformation. Leo dies shortly after Raphael in 1521. Raphael Santi, black sheep in a counter-reformation world? Besides unavoidable criminal ties, Raphael's penchant for ancient classical philosophy, such as Gnosticism, is also against the fervent moral spirituality of his day. It is no secret that despite an elevated status under Julius II, standard training, classicism, fascinates Raphael. Gnosticism infers concepts of dual powers between God and the material world, divinity and semi-divinity. Where Christianity emphasizes outward dogmatic manifestations of morality through behavior, Gnosticism stresses private inclinations towards civic duty, Humanism. Margarita Ludi, Raphael's unconventional model and love. When Margarita Ludi, the local baker's daughter, grabs the attention of handsome artists in 16th century Rome, Raphael is no exception. Their friendship begins professionally. Margarita's hometown is the historical Via del Governo Vecchio, Centro Storico Rome, between Piazza D'Orologio and Piazza Paschino, an area I have walked through many times. Until Gentileschi's time, females could not work with male models or pose for artists. But Margarita's cameo and Raphael's many portraits, even semi-nude, suggest that this pair follows anything but the conventional norms of society and breaks all unspoken rules. One nativity scene female in traditional red wedding gown, Madonna del Velo at Palatine Gallery, Palazzo Pitti, Florence, gazing at her baby, suggests that this couple did wed and had children. Scandal, baker's daughter, cardinal's niece, and a plagiarized print. Despite scandal and speculation, Raphael's unconventional lifestyle does not thwart his success. Even workshop artisan Marcantonio Raimondi's alleged plagiarized print from renowned German artist Albrecht Dürer's engraving does not diminish Raphael's high acclamation 
as a professional artist, and Leo X hires him to excavate the ancient ruins of Rome. The plagiarized print leads to Albrecht's confrontation with Venetian authorities in 1506. As for Raphael's romantic indiscretions, they caused scandal, for Raphael was already betrothed to Maria, Cardinal Medici Bibiana's niece, since 1514, after being offered her dowry of 3,000 ducats. But Raphael then crashes head over heels for Margarita. The semi-nude La Fornarina, 1520, is Raphael's last painting of Margarita. It causes a stir. Is this when Maria Bibiana dies? Does Raphael abandon his betrothal to challenge rigid social norms that prohibit prominent men from marrying peasant women or for power rather than love? Or does Raphael distance himself due to the Patsy scandal? Raphael's work expresses duality in a culture of educational reform. Although Raphael sees the world as an atheist, he is every bit a humanist and translates dual perspective into his work. Before Counter-Reformation, humanism is sti still a developing aspect of Italian culture, where public and private virtuosity and scientific observation precede religious dogma and scholasticism. The humanist movement began earlier with three late medieval and early Renaissance intellectuals. Dante Alighieri, 1265-1321, Petrarch, 1304-1374, and Giovanni Boccaccio, 1313-1375, who believed that the study of humanism by scholars and poets would unleash a necessary educational revolution. The alleged basis for such reform is an outcome of the bubonic pandemic and false assumptions about human salvation. Italian popes placed too great an emphasis on material grandeur and created false ideas ideas on human virtue. Ultimately, the Grand Inquisition later dealt with humanism's contradictions and negations of Christian values. Raphael views and recreates Margarita through the eyes of a classical humanist. Raphael learned of classical art architecture and the humanist elements from Fra Carnavale and Perugino. A precisely balanced expression between old and new values became a precious skill. Raphael's representations of La Fornarina express his own perfect balance between individual virtue and spirituality. The Donna Vallata reveals a blend of personal virtue and opulence. The veil expresses polite culture, moral reservation. Opulent garments with deep folding mark high social status and numinous inclinations. Hand on chest indicates a reconciliation between the Christian and Judaic worlds. It is a Christian confessional right to beat the left breast over the heart with the right fist, common after the bubonic plague as self-flagellation. The alternate perspective indicates a Jewish symbol to remind one of spoken words and penitence. Both interpretations infer guilt and remorse. Does Raphael infer his own remorse regarding an abandon of conventional norms surrounding Maria? Mysteries surrounding Raphael Santi's permanent resting place. Raphael's declining health occurs during a time when smallpox devastates significantly reduced and weakened Aztec communities. Charles V conquers the empire. It is not clear what ailment Raphael contracts. Vasari speculates that it pertains to an unconventional relationship with Margarita. Since Maria died shortly before Raphael, could it be that he contracted the illness from her? Raphael falls ill in 1520 at 37 and dies two weeks later after leaving relatives with 16,000 ducats for the provision of Margarita Ludi. It seems his broken engagement with Maria remains a focal issue surrounding his death. Raphael's final resting place infers more mystery. He lies at the Pantheon, Rome, near Maria Bibiana's tomb. Her uncle, Cardinal Bibiana, Bernardo da Vizi, is close to Leo X. Had it not been for Raphael's express wishes to 
acknowledge Maria as Zafian's wife in the epitaph, the artist's illness, death, and resting place might be even more mysterious today. Raphael Santi's Legacy If there is any speculation about Raphael's ties with Urbino and the Medici, it never threatens his pers personal or professional integrity. Raphael's death devastates Leo. We remember Raphael for graceful, intricately detailed work. His death ends the high Renaissance mannerist style. Since Raphael's death in 1520, countless artists tried to recapture Raphael's presence on canvas based on his outstanding accomplishments, charisma, and unique perspective on life and love. Raphael goes down as a risk taker, for despite professional ties with Cardinal Bibiana, he keeps Maria at bay and protects Margarita from prejudice until his death. Even though I scour books for valid information on Maria's death, it is only apparent that she tragically dies ill in 1520. Raphael's dualistic perspectives previously prevented me from obtaining a clear idea about his personality. Now I think I understand him. Raphael respects and values professional ties and obligations. Despite disapproval of Margarita, he, dis he strongly objects to a norm that people of different social backgrounds are not acceptable, but merely tolerated. Love alerts him to this injustice. As Raphael, Raphael earns support of leaders and patrons everywhere, it is easy for him to hang on to his individuality. In simple words, Raphael refuses to compromise his happiness for the sake of traditional societal norms. It is likely why Raphael probably was single when he died. In researching Raphael, I faced a challenge of ambiguous information and had to independently interpret the little information I did have. Like Raphael, I detest social barriers and view them as a form of aggressive violence, which I decry, no matter what the circumstances. Violence can also be where someone labels, condemns, and falsely accuses, using socialist principles merely to assert false opinions based on hatred and discrimination. I seek to expose such flaws by retreating into the past to reveal how others, through art or other means, peacefully asserted their roles in society. Violent societies with disruptive, greedy entities will never undermine those based on our charter of rights and constitution. Is violent resistance a good way to challenge corruption, or is effective resistance rather a systematic an unrelenting challenge of injustice. I want to engage you, Game Changers, in taking a peaceful stand, not violent, against discriminatory attitudes everywhere, no matter who, no matter what, no matter where. Discrimination leads to a withholding of information and rights. That, in itself, a war of words rather than deeds, is a malicious, violent, vicious attack on an individual or on the world, regardless of race, gender, age, or ethnicity. Hope you've enjoyed this discussion on the mysterious life and death of the Italian Renaissance artist Raphael Santi. Do you agree with my personal interpretation of his life? Have you ever had to sacrifice your own happiness and love for the sake of convention or someone else's expectations? Please comment below. Thank you for watching to the end, and please like and subscribe. Bye for now.